make a positive confession of faith this morning? How many of you brought your Bibles? How many of you brought your phones on your Bibles on your phones? See, the generation, it gets different every time. But if you have a phone, you want to hold that up, <laughs> you can do that. So say it with me. This is my Father's Word. I have what it says I have. My heart's receptive. I have ears to hear, eyes to see. I'm not leaving the same. Turn your neighbor and say, you're not leaving the same. In Yeshua's name. Blessed is the Holy One for His Word, and blessed is the Almighty forever and ever. And all of His people said, Amen. Amen be Amen. Remain standing. I'm going to take you into the Renewed Covenant this morning, and we're going to have a little talk about something most of you think you know everything about. But I'm going to share with you some insights. May the Ruach HaKodesh show you some things. Go with me into the, go into the book of Matityahu, Matthew. Starting at verse 13, Then Yeshua came from the Galil to Yochanan, to John, to be immersed by him in the Jordan. But Yochanan tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be immersed by you, and you're coming to me? But Yeshua responded, let it happen now, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Yochanan yielded to him, and after being immersed, Yeshua rose up out of the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of the Almighty, descending like a dove and coming upon him. And behold, a voice from the heavens said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And all his people said, Amen. Amen. Um, before you're seated this morning, turn to your neighbor and say, Shabbat Shalom. I'm glad you're here. We're coming into a season of repentance of Teshuvah. The month of Elul is the month where we prepare our hearts as Messianic Jews to really get things right before the High Holy Days. How many of you have ever celebrated the High Holy Days with us? So you understand this is a season of preparation. Everyone say preparation. Part of that preparation, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the, the Tabernacle Sukkot, all of this is culminating with Sukkot, but you have to prepare your heart to meet the king face to face. That's what it's all about. Really, the holidays are a picture of what we say in the Renewed Covenant or the New Testament. It's a picture of the Messiah returning to the, to the earth. Rosh Hashanah, Yom, Yom Teruah, the shofar sounds. There's a 10-day period of judgment, which is, if you think about it, the bride is caught up at the sound of the shofar. She's hidden away with the Messiah. There's 10 days. We see that 10-day that period, that, that season of judgment upon the earth culminating at the end when we return with the Messiah in the heavens to rule and reign on this earth, celebrating a thousand years. That's Sukkot. So all of the holidays are really a picture of the things that are coming. If you don't understand that, then you, you know this is why we're here today to understand that. Part of the process of coming into the presence of Adonai, preparing our hearts to meet the Almighty, is what we call a mikvah. Now, some might remember this or see this as a baptism. But I want to look at this in a little bit of a different light today. There's baptism, or what Jewish people call the mikvah. How many have ever been baptized? If you've been baptized, just wave at me if you have. So if I ask you or ask a traditional person who is a Christian, what is baptism? There are so many concepts. If you come, we're going to look at some pictures. Can we see the pictures, Lori? Let's look at some pictures of baptism today. So this is a traditional picture of a man who is experiencing baptism probably by a friend or a pastor or an elder within his church. And traditionally, you'll see somebody, they'll take them and they'll dunk them underneath. It's where we get the word baptizo. It means to actually go totally under the water. Um, years ago, if you're like a friend of mine who is a pastor of a church down the road, he said he had this beautiful baptismal in the, um, in the rock. And so I thought, well, there's this huge baptismal pool in this big rock. And I go into his church to see it. He's like, you've got to come see it. It's, um, it's Martin Luther's, where he worked from this rock quarry. And I'm thinking, this thing's going to be huge. And I go in, and I'm like, well, where's the, where's the baptismal? It was, 
He's the Lutherans that sprinkle. And so it's just a little thing of water. Well, I'm looking for this big rock. He's got this little tiny thing, you know. He's, he's like, there it is, Rabbi. And I'm like, oh, I said, you guys sprinkle. I forgot. But this is a traditional way. If you've been baptized, the Greek, really the Greek concept is to go under the water. It's to go fully under the water, to be immersed. So we say immersion. The Jewish people would say a mikvah. Let's look at the, the other pictures. Different traditions have different things. Uh, there is a horse trough. Now, and then there's a baby. Go back to the horse trough, Lori, and then we'll go back to the baby here. But the horse trough, uh, years ago, not too long ago, Tom and I went into the prison system, and he had quite a crowd of Messianic believers that wanted to experience the mikvah. And so Tom said, what are we going to do? Was it a horse trough that we used, Tom, or what was it? Very similar. And we probably saw 20-plus 20, 20 men uh, get baptized or mikvahed in that day. So we say, well, this is one concept, but understand, they're going under the water and they're coming back in. Look at the next, please. Some churches teach, the Catholic Church and others, that uh, Greek Orthodox as well, that babies, baptism is when you're a baby. And so the, Greek, the Catholics will sprinkle the baby, pour water on the baby's head, but the Greeks, now the Greek, how many have ever seen the Greek Orthodox? They'll take the baby and dunk it. Literally, they'll dunk the baby three times. So, you know, different concepts of baptism here. Look at the uh, next, please. The, the word for baptism in, in the Jewish concept of a baptism is actually a mikvah. Everyone say mikvah. This is called a mikvah pool. In a mikvah, a Jew will not allow another person to touch him because they see it as a personal thing between that individual and God himself. And so when we go, we're getting ready to do our mikvah in two weeks. Everybody say two weeks. So what will we do? We've done this for many, many years. We go down into the lake. It has to be living springs, living water. It's moving. And you go, to the, you go there and, and, of course, we'll pray. We stand with you. But I don't touch you. The elders don't touch you. We watch, we observe, but it's between you and the Almighty. You go into the water. Um, this is something that we do. Now, we're going to talk about traditional and also Messianic Jews and Christians. If you're here today and you're a Christian, we want to share this with you. You'll say, well, I don't see any moving water in this pool. If you were to examine this pool, that one looks a little green. I don't know. But if you were to examine the pools, there's actually a place where the rainwater comes down into the pool and then you are allowed to, about 200 gallons of rainwater, the Jews say 40 seahs, there's a measurement there. But you mix that, you can actually mix that where the waters kiss each other, they can blend. But this is living water. Everyone say living water. There's another mikvah. In, those, these are usually found within synagogues. Um, for Jewish people, you would make an appointment to go and you would mikvah. People mikvah before weddings. They mikvah uh, for various reasons, before they start a new job, if they're divorced and they're starting a new life, uh, before they're going to college. Orthodox men will actually mikvah before every Shabbat. It's seen really as an entranceway to a new beginning. So everybody say new beginnings. So how many of you could use a new beginning? So it's, it's traditionally taught within some of the churches that the mikvah is something that washes away your sins. I hate to pop your bubble. Mikvah doesn't wash away sin. We know as believers in Yeshua that the blood of Messiah is what cleanses us and bought us and paid the price for us. Amen? But yet, there is still something to be said about the mikvah or the baptism. Now, mikvah in Hebrew is actually a noun. That is the collection of the body of water. Everyone say mikvah. You know what's interesting is the mame is actually a picture of of a wave or water. The, the word for water itself is ma'im in Hebrew, and it begins and it ends with the letter ma'im, which is water. It's a picture of water. It's very interesting. So the mikvah has to do with water, living water, moving water. And some churches teach, some people teach that uh, the water will wash away your sins. There are old songs that I'm going to go down to the river and wash away my sins. Well, really your faith in Messiah is what cleanses you. The blood of Messiah cleanses you. But, having said that, there is a place for the mikvah or the baptism. The Bible has a lot to say about baptism. How many know that? Even for us as Messianic Jews, I want to look at this from a Jewish perspective. How many of you have ever experienced a mikvah? Just wave at me. 
Most of you have. Um, a mikvah, we're going to look at, at some concepts. There's some ancient mikvot. Mikvot is the, the plural. There are ancient mikvot seen in Israel today. They found some in Jerusalem. There's one at Masada. Uh, there are other places in Israel that have them. Remember in the book of Acts when people got saved? How many people got saved? 3,000 people. And remember that day when they said, what must we do to be saved? And Kepha or Peter's response was what? Repent and mikvah. You know how many people got saved that day? 3,000 people. Roger, we thought 120 were a long time to mikvah. Can you imagine 3,000 in one day? And we say, where did they go to mikvah? Around, if you'll, if you'll read history, around the temple, they had, they had the mikvah pools. And so it was for the crowds who would come and worship. So I'm giving you a little bit of history here to say it wasn't just one or two pools. They had many pools. Uh, what's the concept of a mikvah for us as believers? I'm glad you asked. We, I want to answer that today, hopefully. Um, let's look at just a couple things with the mikvah. In traditional Judaism... There are three aspects, and I, I need to go there because we're going to go as believers in Yeshua. You may not even be familiar with Judaism today, but how many want to learn today? So why am I talking about Judaism if you're a believer in Yeshua? Because you have to understand the roots of our faith. If, if you're not Jewish here and you don't understand, where does all this come from? Is this something that um, our leaders taught us, or, or does it go even farther back? Baptism goes farther back than what you or I could even imagine. It goes all the way back to the Ganaden, the Garden of Eden, where we see water. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, right? The earth was tovu vebohu. In the Hebrew, it's, it's chaos. It's, it's without form and void. And literally, it made a, the rabbis say it made a humming, like a sound of distortion. And the Almighty steps in, and he silences everything. And then he says, light. And light comes up on the scene. And then we see the water and we see the earth and we see him beginning to create. We're going to talk about that this morning. How many of you know that when Adonai shows up on the scene, all chaos is removed? We think of another mikvah. Think of another mikvah way back when. Remember Noah? The world experienced a mikvah, didn't it? A cleansing, so to speak. And a renewal. Because after the mikvah was a renewal. When you see a mikvah, you always see something new. Here's Yeshua who comes up on the scene. People say, Yeshua didn't... It bothers me when people say, Yeshua didn't teach anything new. Yeshua taught a lot of things that were new. He elevated the Torah. He would take concepts. He'd said, you're here and you guys say, but he said, I say to you, and he would elevate that. So do we see Yeshua mikvah? Sure do. Why did Yeshua mikvah? Was it because he was full of sin? No. Yeshua was the perfect lamb of God. How many know that? But yet he said, this is a pattern that I'm setting for my people. Book of Matthew, I believe it is, tells us that when he told his Talmudim, his disciples, he said, when you guys make disciples, he says, you go into all the nations. And he said, make Talmudim or disciples. By the way, that word means a learner. How many learners do I have here? So you're always learning. You're always growing. A Talmud will follow his rabbi. And so he says, you make disciples and you baptize or mikvah them in the name of Father, Son, and Spirit. When we go down to the lake, Adonai willing, we mikvah in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Roha Kodesh. And it's not a boring time, guys. It's an exciting time. We celebrate. Spirit of Adonai usually moves in that. Uh, we've seen signs and wonders. We've seen unusual things. We had one, one year we saw an eagle fly right over our group of people, a bald eagle fly right over, circle around us, and whew, took off. We've seen unusual signs and wonders. Um, one year we had a guy who, you know, people watch us from the beach. And so we come down, we're into the waters, and it's a pretty good-sized crowd. And um, this guy comes, he's in the water, and I'm watching our line of people. And this guy's in the water, and he comes swimming over. He swims over into our line, and when it's his turn, he swims up to me. I have no idea who he is. So I'm looking at him, and I ask him the same question I ask everybody else. Do you believe in Yeshua as your Messiah? And he said, yes. I said that he died for you, rose again, and coming back. He goes, yes. I said, in the name of the Father. The guy goes down. In the name of the Son. He goes down three times. Guess what? He gets up, and he swims away. <laughs> Just like a little fish, he swims away. I said, this is pretty good. The fish are jumping in the boat. I said, hallelujah. So I still don't know who the guy was. Maybe he was an angel. I don't know. 
But there's this concept of a mikvah. It's not something that really the, the church instituted. But Yeshua took the mikvah and he elevated it. He said, if you believe in me, he said, you have a new beginning in me. And so when we, as a confession of faith, make our faith for a community, we make a stand in our faith to say, this is who I am now. This is a new beginning for me. How many of you know when you have Yeshua, you have a new beginning? So we just think that's a one-time event. Yes, you're saved one time. But, but hear me out. Every day is a new beginning. His mercies are what? New every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So he's got this, this new mercy and new beginning for us every day. I want to look at three things within Judaism, uh, traditional Judaism. And we're going to look at what's called the sod or the mystery of this. According to the, the, um, the Jewish concepts of a mikvah, number one, it's a ritual that brings the impurity to purity. So if you're familiar, the concept of bringing the impure to the pure. The concept of, uh, of tuma tahor, the uh, defilement of something. You would mikvah it, and then it would spiritually bring it clean again. Okay. Number two, the rabbis say that it's a transformation process when a Gentile wants to convert to Judaism. So in, in the ancient days, or even today, if you say, I want to become Jewish. Now, we don't convert people here. But if you go into a traditional synagogue and you say, I want to become Jewish, you, you study, you study, you learn, you sit at the feet of the rabbi, you learn, you do the stuff you need to do, but in the, in the end process, you, go, you undergo, you go in the water and you mikvah. And when you come out, you've been transformed into a Jew, according to the rabbinic studies. And number three, this is a time where you take new cooking utensils and new cooking vessels and you prepare them for use. So you take the utensils and you mikvah them, and now they are no longer just ordinary utensils, but they are utensils for your use to feed you. Interesting. We say, well, what's that all about? I saw three concepts here that if we can get into, I want you to see this, because they all relate to us as believers in Messiah. How many believers in Yeshua do I have in the house? Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm ready for this word. The mikvah waters we discussed were first seen in Bereshit in Genesis. When Adonai brought the waters and he splits the waters. Um, let's talk about the waters for just a moment. We talk about transformation. There's only, the rabbis say this, that there's only transformation when a person who comes into the waters um, makes a direct connection with the water. In other words, you cannot have anything, uh, if you were to go to a traditional synagogue, and you said, well, I want to cleanse myself spiritually. So you go to the mikvah waters. Traditionally, you, you would go into the room and you mikvah with no clothes on. Now, we don't do that at the lake. <laughs> we, please show up wearing something, right? Um, I always kid Roger to say, I don't know, maybe we'd get more people to come if we did it that way. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> we might make the newspapers. But... You, you understand that when, let's look at this for just a moment, because when you're transforming, you say, well, if you're spiritually impure and you want to become pure again, if you're a Jew, you go to the mikvah waters. And you, anything, you, nothing separates you from the waters. The immerser and the water have to literally become one. You cannot wear clothing. You cannot wear jewelry. You cannot have your wallet in your back pocket. You can't have a ring on your finger because that is... There's a little part of you that is keeping the water from touching you. So the immerser has to be connected to the waters of the world. Are you getting the picture? When we go to the, the mikvah, I always tell people, I say, they come in, and I, I, the ladies always come in with earrings or, you know, some ladies. We used to have, they wear all the jewelry. And I say, guess what? You got to take off all your jewelry. So we do? I say, well, yeah, you really should. So you take off your rings because... That's a symbol that nothing is coming between you and those waters. And I thought about that. I thought, think about that as a believer. When we go into, we have a relationship with Adonai. There should be nothing that distracts us or comes between us and the living water of the God of Israel. If you're, if you're wearing, you know, when you mikvah, if you've, if you've mikvahed before, and most of you have, you understand this concept. 
But when you come and you say, I really want to be ritually pure in this season, can you confess a prayer and say, Father, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. It's been a rough season. Please forgive me. I know I acted in the flesh with this person or that person. Yes, you can do that. But there's something to be said about stepping out in faith. Your faith, are you all getting this? Your faith moves you to do something. Now, you can't clean yourself, but your faith in Messiah is taking that step of faith to say, I'm coming to the waters. I need a new beginning. I don't know about you, but this year has been a tough year in some places. And I need a new beginning. And there are some things that, that I have thought of in the flesh or acted out in the flesh. Um, I'm a normal human being too. Y'all don't look at me with eyes like that, you know. So, so what do we do every year? I say, Father, I'm preparing my heart. I want you to touch my heart again and recalibrate me, get my spirit back to where I need to be. It's been a hard season. Sometimes you just feel off. And I can tell you, there's something about coming into those waters and connecting with those waters. And when we come out of those waters again, it's like a new beginning, a whole new beginning again. Not that I'm re-saved again, but it's just a season of new beginnings. Turn your neighbor and say, new beginnings. I always ask Adonai for a sign at, at the mikvah. I say, could you give us a sign that you're pleased? And he's always given us a sign. A few years back, we didn't, we didn't get a sign. I said, where's my sign? We didn't get anything that year. We're, there was no eagles. There was no nothing. I, but he was still in our midst. We didn't get a sign. So after the mikvah, I always, I, you know, Roger and I stand out there. We got our coffee. We're freezing in the waters after like three hours, right? So I said, it's time to eat. And what do we do? We get Chinese food. That's a tradition for us. So I go and I pick up my Chinese food, and I'm taking it home. I said, where's our sign? And I open up my fortune cookie, and it had one word in it. It said, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. I said, got my sign. <laughs> I don't know about you. I've never seen a fortune cookie with the word hallelujah in it. But I got it that day. There's something to be said about making that connection, stepping out in faith, and saying, I don't want anything between the master and me. If you look at Leviticus, Viagra 15, I believe it is, it talks about when things happen in the flesh, that the waters of the mikvah will cleanse you. Water will cleanse you. Everybody say water. And so uh, Le uh, it's Leviticus 15, 16, that the man would wash his body all in water. He would be unclean until evening. Now we say that's kind of weird, but there's something to be said about the spirit. You know, we, we're a body, but we're a spirit that lives in a body. There are things from the past that can defile your spirit, and they can just kind of hang on. You come into the mikvah waters and all that stuff, through the blood of Messiah, all that stuff goes away. All that stuff. Um, go with me. I'll show you something, too, because I found this interesting. We're talking about transformation. Everybody say transformation. So this speaks of intimacy between Adonai. You come into the waters, it's a very intimate thing. A bride, before she marries, will go to the waters and show mikvah because she's, she's making a statement that she wants intimacy with her husband. If you're a believer here today in Yeshua, you have to have intimacy with him. Don't go through the stages to say, well, I'm going to say my prayers and I'm going to do this and that. If you don't have intimacy with the creator of the earth, you have nothing. You have to have intimacy with the Messiah. Do you know what I mean by that? He sees your heart. You see his heart. You know you have relationship with him. You realize you can't hide anything from him? When you come into the mikvah waters, you can't put your wallet in your back pocket and your watch on. Well, Rabbi, my watch is waterproof. I'm so glad, but you can't wear it at the mikvah because it represents the things of the world. You know the things of the world can separate us from intimacy with Adonai? I'm not saying it's wrong to have a waterproof watch or a nice car or a nice house. If you have an issue with that, you have an issue with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What I'm saying is this. If that stuff has you, you're in trouble. I'm reminded of a story, Steve, that a, a very wealthy woman got into her car, and she got into a car wreck, and the, the uh, fire department showed up, and they were helping her out of the car, and the car was totaled. And she's, she's in the car, and she's, she's standing there, and she's going, my Lexus, my Lexus, my Lexus. And the fireman said, ma'am, he says, you don't understand. He says, your arm is tore off. She goes, my Rolex, my Rolex, my Rolex. <laughs> Sorry. I said all that to make a point. We can let the stuff of the world get in our hearts and get to us. And that'll steal your intimacy with Adonai. 
And you have, to, you have to guard your heart with that. It's very easy to get into that. The things of the world, the ideas of the world. When you come into the mikvah waters, you have, it's a transforming. You're, for us as believers in Yeshua, we're being transformed from we're saved by the blood, but your life is being transformed. How many of you, your lives have been transformed by the power of Yeshua the Messiah? Again, there's nothing you can do to save yourself, but it's a step of faith. And you have to have intimacy. Don't let anything separate you from the waters, the living waters of the living God of Israel. Um, transformation. Everybody say transformation. Remember number two, to be transformed from a Gentile to a Jew. Well, for us as believers, we understand you're going from a world of death to a world of life. You realize that we are called to walk in newness of life? You got real quiet on that one. You're, our lives should be really ongoing and, and full of life. If you don't have life, you're missing the creator of life, the one who gives us life. We've gone from being a, a one who's non-saved, really what I would say a goy, who we don't, you know, before you came to know the Messiah, you didn't care about the Bible. You didn't have the Bible. You didn't have God's promises. But when you got saved... And when you, you receive Messiah in your heart, you go in into the mikvah or the baptism, you may have called it. You come out. Guess what? You now have his word. You now have his spirit. You have him. Turn to your neighbor and say, I have him. So there was a transformation. If you've never, please hear me today. If you've never experienced trans, transformation, the power of being transformed in your heart and in your thought, come see me. We'll pray for you. You, you need that. You need to walk in that. Number three, I found it interesting about the cooking vessels. The rabbis say this, that if you get a new vessel for cooking, it has to be stripped clean of everything, and then you immerse or you mikvah the vessels. And we say, well, where do we get a message out of that? I'm so glad you asked. Go with me. I want you to see this, 2 Timothy 2.20. This is Rav Shaul or Paul saying this to Timothy. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some of honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone, what, cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. How many want to be a vessel that Adonai can use? I'll, I, I want to tell you this this morning. You and I are vessels, but are you a clean vessel? Are you a vessel of honor? He'll use you in any way. If, listen, guys, if you come to my house and see, I have, I have a... I have china, we have nice plates and things that we use, but we also have plungers in the bathroom. <laughs> and if you understand, plungers are also useful, right? And they have a job to do. But I don't know about you, I don't want to be the plunger. In Adonai's house, I want to be a vessel of honor. And so why do we come to this season when we come into our season and we come again to the mikvah waters? It's to say, you know what? We want to be those vessels of honor again to wash away the, the mindset of this past year, the past stuff we've been through, pa you know, the stuff. You know what I mean by the stuff, right? Just the stuff. So that, in a sense, is the mikvah, as we see as Messianic Jews, that it purifies, it cleanses. Where do the waters come from? Genesis 2, go with me there if you would. I want to look at this just a little bit deeper. And Adonai, Yahweh God, formed man out of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And Yahweh God planted a garden eastward in Eden. In the Hebrew, you would say Gan Eden. Try that with me. Say Gan Eden. So that's the Garden of Eden, or we get the Greek word paradise. So in the Garden of Eden, he puts the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground Adonai Elohim made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from it there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Bishon. It's the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there's gold. It goes on to say the second name of the river is Gihon. Look at the third river is Hidakel, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Get the picture. I want to paint a picture for you in your mind. Everything is perfect. Everything is good. Everything is clean. There's no tuma. There's no uncleanness at this point. Everything is perfect. Everybody say perfection. What would it have been like to live in a place like that? Perfect weather, Steve. 
We didn't always have to adjust the air conditioner. Perfect weather, no rain, or maybe there, whatever they had, it was perfect. Perfect trees, perfect flowers, per perfect smells, perfect sounds. The animals weren't running from you. We just recently went to the Columbus Zoo. Very interesting day. You meet some interesting people at the zoo. Yeah, some, <laughs> yeah, that's why they have cages, right? <laughs> some interesting people at the zoo. But we saw animals and we saw all this stuff. And we saw some beautiful animals, but we saw a rhinoceros. The rhinoceros didn't have a horn. Somebody took its horn off. My wife said, look, at, she said, the rhino doesn't have a horn. She said, why would they cut the rhino's horn off? I said, honey, I don't think the zoo did it. I think the poachers did it, and they probably rescued it. But that zoo, even though the animals were beautiful, it was not perfect. In Adam's day, everything was perfect. Think about when the last time you had was a perfect day. How many of you have ever had like a perfect day? You ever had a real good day? Think about how you felt. Think about what it looked like. Perfect. And here is in, in the, the, the Garden of Ganaden, everything is perfect. They felt good. They smelled. Everything was perfect. There was no tum, tum, there was no uh, tuma. There was no sin. There was no defilement until Adam and Eve made the choice to sin and to rebel. Ultimately, that led into death. Everything, follow me, everything that is unclean is connected to death. How many of you know that? Wave at me. Every unclean thought, every unclean action, every action that does not line up with Adonai's word, it is connected to the first choice of Adam and Hava. Every, every sickness, every cough that you coughed, every little COVID spell that you came through, everything that, you know, think about it. Every little hair loss that falls out of as we get older, the gray hairs and the stuff, all that's connected to death. And death is connected to impurity, which is connected to rebellion. And I found it very interesting that when Adam, you don't see this in the Bible, but when Adam sinned, there's an old writing from the rabbis that say that when Adam sinned and Adonai put him out of the garden, it was, by the way, a Saturday night, according to the rabbis, after Shabbat, he takes him and he puts him out of the garden, and now he's lost and he's without hope. I want you to think about that. Going from a place of perfection to a place of no hope and lost. What does Adam do? The rabbis say that he went and he sat down in the rivers and he mikvahed. His very first step was mikvah, which brings us to the root word for mikvah, which is kava. Everybody say kava. That's the word for hope. So I want you to see that in the very word for mikvah or baptism is the word for hope. And so Adam, who is now hopeless at this point, goes to the waters and he sits in the waters and he mikvahs. Why is it that you and I mikvah? Because we have a hope. Turn to your neighbor and say, I have a hope. No matter how hopeless you feel or how defiled you feel or how defiled the situation is, if you serve the God of living waters, you have hope. It's the same word where we see, remember Rahab? You guys are familiar with the story of Rahab? And what did she do? Her town was going to be disintegrated. But they said, do one thing. You take a cord, and you take that red cord, and you throw it out your window. You know what the name for cord in Hebrew is? Tikvah. You again, kava, hope. Her hope was seen in the cord hanging out the window. Very interesting. You and I are called not to be a people of hopelessness, but a people of hope. When... Here's Adam who went from being covered with the Shekinah, or the rabbis say the glory of, of the Almighty. What did that look like? To walk around with the glory shining through you, just as we see in Yeshua when he's up on the mountain with Eliyahu and Moses. And here is, here is the first Adam in all his glory. And when he sins, he loses his glory, and he's naked, and he's ashamed, and he's afraid, and he has no hope. But yet Adonai said, there will, come, there will come one from her loins that will crush the head of the serpent. There is still hope. How many of you know Adonai never leaves us without hope? Jeremiah tells it this way. It says that the God of Israel is called the, the hope of Israel. The, he says, all those that forsake me, the living waters, have lost their hope. But he said, I am the hope of Israel. How many of you know he's our hope? So when we come to the waters... 
and we go into those waters as a first-time believer, we are hoping, not just hoping like, okay, I hope this works, but we're making a declaration of faith to say, my hope is in the, the living waters, the God of Israel. What did Yeshua say in the Renewed Covenant? He said, you guys, you know, they're, they're doing this water libation at Sukkot. You take the water and they would, a grand march, a big procession, you come back, you pour the water and the blood over the altar. It was, it was the, called the living water. And Yeshua said this. He said, you guys want living water? He said, I'm the living water. I am your hope. And yet all through our lives, we try to put our hope in our stuff and in our people, in the people we're closest to. Don't even do that. He said, I am your hope, O Israel. We go into those waters, we go down in, and as a believer this year, you're probably a believer, why are you coming to the waters? To say again, no matter what comes our way in this new season, we're making a statement of faith. We're dying to ourselves, going into the waters, dying to ourselves, nothing hidden within our hearts, everything open to him, and we come up again with a new sense of hope within us. That's hope. Step of faith. Rabbi, there's nothing we can do to save us ourselves. That's true. But there is something you can do to take a step of faith, to make a proclamation to the, those around you to say, he is my hope. Find two people around you. Tell them, he is my hope. You know something else interesting that I found? Is that there's another thing that I think we need to dig in these things and find out because I was amazed to see that the rabbis say this. Those four rivers were actually three were connected to the main one. But the rivers were placed there because, now follow me. This is not in scripture, but this is a rabbinic concept that we can learn from. The rabbis say that the rivers were placed there because if Adam were to ever wander from the Garden of Eden, Eden, Canadian, he would find his way back home by the water. Do you get that? If man were to ever wander and get lost, he could always come back home through the waters. How is it that we as, think about it, Adam was lost. He was a lost soul. We were, how many of you know, you and I were lost souls. But yet here's one who steps up on the scene and he says, I am the living water and I am the hope of Israel. He says, you want to come back home? He says, you come through me. And so when we make a statement of faith in Yeshua's living water, we go down and we come up. We are, we are coming back home, so to speak. I found a very interesting concept. If you look in, uh, if you look in the book of Zechariah 13.1, can we pull it up there? Can, would you guys read that together as a congregation? So in that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. And we say, well, what does that mean? Spiritually speaking, there's a picture here to say there would be a fountain that would be open that would cleanse all of Israel from their sin. When did that happen? Go with me to the book of John. John 19, 34. Yeshua is hanging on a tree. He's the one called the living water. He is the hope of Israel. As he's hanging on the tree, he dies. One of the soldiers takes a spear. John 19, 34 says, he takes the spear, he pierces the Messiah's side, and out come what? Blood and water. The fountain was open for the house of Israel in that day. Literally, Yeshua's blood and water came out as a picture of man to say, listen, I know, Adam, you're lost. You come back home through the second Adam. And so that fountain was open. Go with me to Galatians 3.26. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Y'all are quiet today. Wave at me if you got at least one thing. Look at Galatians 3.26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through, watch this, faith in Messiah Yeshua. For as many of you were baptized or mikvahed into Messiah, have put on the Messiah. I want to say that again. As many, as, as many of you have mikvahed into Messiah, you have put on the Messiah. Remember Adam? Naked and ashamed. Goes into the waters and he sits. Here's Yeshua. Fountain is opened in the house of Israel. And now you and I are no longer, listen, we're no longer naked. You're not naked anymore. You are clothed. Through the second Adam, we're no longer naked. Isn't that good? I saw that, I went, wow. We don't have to be ashamed anymore. 
You don't have to walk around with a shamed attitude. Well, Rabbi, you don't know what I've been through or what my life has been through, what I've been through as a kid. You no longer have to hang your head. Lift your head up. You're clothed in the Messiah. You have an authority in Yeshua because you are clothed in Him. That's good news. That's hope. Wherever you go, that's hope. You can carry hope with you. You know that you wear Yeshua's garment. You wear Yeshua's gathering. Some of us here today wear the tzitzit. We wear the prayer shawl. What does that represent? The glory of Israel. The glory of Adonai. But you, if you don't wear tzitzit or a prayer shawl, you are still spiritually clothed in the Messiah if you're a believer in Him. Can a person be saved and not be baptized? Well, yeah. But it, scripturally, we see people always being mikvah. There's always a mikvah. That's your expression of faith that you truly are believing in the Messiah, the God of Israel. If you've never been fully immersed, I would encourage you, come to the waters with us on Sunday morning. You need to be there. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need to be there. There's a way, spiritually, when we look at this, we've come to know Messiah through this because we were lost and we mikvah and we identify with the head who is Yeshua. When you go into those waters, the waters are supposed to be living waters and clean waters. When you identify with those waters, you're identifying with the living water. There's that connection. And Scripture says that it's the body of Messiah, now Jew and Gentile, male and female, uh, we're all one, everybody say one, echad in Messiah, in the God of Israel. It's really, we're kind of like one big tribe. Aren't you glad you belong to one big tribe? That's why when we get visitors, we get our friends from Van Word who drive two hours. It just feels like family. Oh, yeah, you guys are here. Yeah, come on, let's celebrate Messiah. Or we get somebody over here, or we get somebody over there, and they drive in. Because we're one big tribe in Yeshua. Always identify, guys, with the waters of heaven, the living waters. There's hope. If you live in Israel today and you have no water, you have no hope. But if you have water, you have hope. Water is seen as a as life source, as life. Don't forget who you are in Yeshua, the Messiah. Identify with the living waters at this season. I want to go over just a couple scriptures here before I send you home. Um, Matthew 28, 19 to 20, the words of Yeshua, Go there, therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them or giving them a mikvah in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Did Yeshua command anything new? He sure did. He sure did. Was this ever seen before Yeshua? The mikvah was, but not in the name of the Father, the Ruach, and the Son of God. So does Yeshua teach us some things? Yes, he does. Go to uh, look at Acts. I'm setting an example here. Acts 2.38. Kepha Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be mikvah or baptized in the name of Yeshua Messiah for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 8.12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Yeshua Messiah, both men and women were mikvah or baptized. Acts 22.16. I'm just giving you just a few things out of the book of Acts. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be mikvah or baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of Adonai. Acts 10, 48, he commanded them to be baptized or mikvah in the name of Adonai. And then they asked him to stay a few days. So how many of you know that the mikvah to us as believers is important? Wave at me. It's very important. Should you, here's the question before I let you leave. Should you do it one time? Most definitely. Do you have to do it twice? I wouldn't say you have to, but you should. Should you do it every year? I do it every year. Not to say that I'm better than anybody else, but I can tell you I need it. I need it. I, my, my mind gets weary. My heart gets weary. And right before the high holy days, I think, you know what? I want to be in a certain place with him that I'm not there yet. And as hard as I try, Steve, as hard as I push and I try, it seems like I take, sometimes I take three steps and then take one back, two more, one back. Am I the only one that ever feels like that sometimes? And life will throw things at you and people will throw things at you. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is tough. But if you, I tell you this, guys, if you take that first step by faith to say, you know what, I'm going to make fun. Line up my heart, Father. He'll do it. You come up out of those waters, you're ready for a new season. 
you're ready for a new beginning. Usually we sound the shofars, people sound the shofars. Some years it's very quiet, but it is a season of renewal. Look at first, uh, first Kepha, First Peter 3.21. He says, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism or the mikvah. Not the removal of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit we're all baptized or mikvahed into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, all have been made to drink into one spirit. Colossians 2, 12, buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. By demonstrating that you step into those mikvah waters, you're making a statement of faith to say, I, I got a new life. And there's power in that life. Questions or comments? Yes, Ben, come here. I'm going to give you the microphone real quick. And then maybe we can take some comments. We'll do old school like we used to. Number, they're on number 10. Yes. And then maybe you can hit others. Yeah, Rabbi, it's interesting. Uh, this week in the news, uh, the basketball team from Auburn University did a, a baptism in the Jordan River. Ooh. And I was thinking about um, the Jordan River, and then I think it was Naaman and it was Elisha. So you think they're going to go full this year and win all the... <laughs> That's what they're talking about, right? <laughs> Is that it? And I was, inter- I was I'm thinking about Naaman, how he was offended whenever he was told by Elisha to, to mikvah in the waters. And why do you suppose people get offended with the mikvah sometimes. I don't know that people today get offended with the mikvah. I've never met anyone that is really offended. But you do have people that will fight you over, well, I've already done it once and I don't need to do it again. Or you guys are really, have you ever heard this one? You guys are really religious. That's a religion thing. No, it's a step of faith. No one, no one forces us to do this. We do this on our own accord as believers in Yeshua. And uh, really, I can tell you, I've been doing this for 25 years, Something does take place within your spirit. When you go into those waters, you, you profess again and say, I need you. You come up out of the waters. He does something in your spirit, in your heart, and it, and it does make you stronger. Now, people will fight over dunking or sprinkling or whatever. Um, even within the churches, some will fight and say, you need to do it in Jesus' name only. There are others who say in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, which we do. Um, you know, we don't get into the big debates of everything. So we just try to keep it simple. Anybody else? Questions? A few questions. Roger and then Brian. Not necessarily a question, but I am reminded, as you said, that there was always something. Normally we got assigned, and we have had it happen multiple times that the boats on the bank, these guys had partied all night, and when they woke up in the morning, they cracked open a beer, they cranked open their rock and roll tunes. Oh, but yeah. the spirit of Adonai took control of that water and when the people saw what we were doing, they, we had the, their respect. They shut it down. Yeah, very interesting. One year we went to the Mikva waters, and uh, the boat beside us began to play ACDC. <laughs> and it's going on, you know, and I'm, and I'm praying in my spirit, oh, Father, <laughs> bind that spirit in the name of Messiah. <laughs> shut it down. And, uh, and they quieted. After a while, it just shut down, and it quieted. So, yeah. yeah. Brian, you had your hand up. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned about the uh, Catholic Church where they sprinkle and everything like that, and they said they do babies like that. Uh, right. But a baby isn't knowledgeable of you know what, what you know what's going on and everything. Your thoughts about that? Um, when you receive Messiah and you decide that you you are making a you are choosing to make a decision, that is a personal decision. You are cognizant of what you're doing, and so you make that statement of faith to say, "I believe in Yeshua as Messiah." Ask him in your heart. We do believe in saying a, a prayer, receiving Messiah, choosing to live your life for him, and then going to the waters. A baby doesn't understand sin. A baby, really, a baby's never sinned. So for us as believers, scripturally, um, hoping you know, hope that doesn't offend you guys, but scripturally, a baby doesn't sin. Um, you know, and a baby can't make a decision to serve Messiah or not. So this is this is a this is an adult choice. Yes, Amy. Uh, we were talking. We, um, you were talking about how that uh, the three, t- three or four rivers pointed um, Adam back to the Garden back to of Eden. Eden. Back and to we that were place. talking about how that's kind of like a shin, 
And yeah. the shin itself is seen in either a three or a four on the uh, frontlets, on yeah. the phylacteries. And that is said to represent the four matriarchs and the three patriarchs. So it's interesting that we have the same representation that Adam had on this side of the Garden of Eden. On this side of the Garden of Eden, Eden we have the patriarchs and the founders of our faith that push us back just like Adam had. Right. That's a good point. Great point. Anybody else? Yep, in the very back to the left. Kristen, is that you? I think it's Kristen. That's me. Hi. Yeah. I wondered if there were, um, you could help us with uh, the pools of Bethesda. Weren't those healing waters? Yeah, the, the pool of Bethesda. Yeah, the, the waters that um, could have very well been a mikvah water. But I think the point, and this is where it was really in my heart, and I'm glad you brought that up, because the whole purpose of that, that you'd have a bunch of people wanting healing. In other words, they needed to come back to a state of perfection in their body to be healed. So there was some uncleanness, whether it was due to sin or physical or whatever. They were not in a state of perfection. And they're waiting around the pool. And what are they waiting for, guys? An angel to trouble the waters. They knew there was something about the waters that would restore them. Now watch this. They had a spirit of expectation. Everybody say expectation. And the one guy, he said, I can't get into the waters because nobody will get me close enough. When the waters move, he says, I can't get to it in time. So you know the story that the guy gets healed. Yeshua heals the guy. I think we can learn from this. For those of you that are coming to the mikvah waters, come with a spirit of expectation. Come with a spirit of expectation that Adonai is going to move on your life and he's going to work things out in you and bring you back to a place of, do I want to say perfection? Maybe not perfection but to a place of realignment, a place of home. Have you, how many chiropractors? I know we have a couple of chiropractors in the congregation. They can tell you a lot about alignment. My, my wife was dealing with an issue in her arm, and she just she's like, man, she said, my arm has just really bothered me, and it's been hurting me. And Dr. Pete, she went over to Dr. Pete, and she told him, she said, I don't know what's going on. She said, my arm's really been, and he, he took her hand like this, he took his thumbs, and she said, I don't know what he did, but he took his two thumbs, and he went, boop, and you heard a pop, and she went, ow, and then she went, it's gone. <laughs> now, her hand wasn't gone, but her arm was, you know, she said, the pain is all gone, and she said, what did he do? Well, he realigned you, and so what I would say is, when you come into the waters this year, I would encourage you to come with a spirit of expectation. Don't just come to say, well, Rabbi told me to come. Or don't just come to say, we've done it for 15 years. Here we are at the waters again. Bring them on. You know, Don't do that. Come with a spirit of expectation to say, Father, I need everything you have for me in this season. If you have that spirit of expectation, he will move in your midst. What did we see when Yeshua went into the waters? The Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of Messiah, is hovering. Just as he did back in Genesis when the Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. You know what's interesting? When you read Matthew 3, follow me on this. Who do you see at the waters? You see the Father, you hear the Father's voice, you see the Word of God, and you see the Spirit. Taking you back to Genesis, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in creation. So when I want you to think of those waters as a place of creation and expectation. So what is it that you need cleansed from in your heart? Maybe some of you, if I can be honest, maybe some of you struggle with addictions. You don't tell anybody about them, but you got them. You struggling with that? Come to the waters. Some of you are struggling with, with your mouth. You say things you shouldn't. Your heart's negative and you speak things you shouldn't. Come to the waters. There's your thought life. You're, you're, you're struggling with depression. You're hurting. You're wounded. You say, man, Rabbi, every day is just a challenge and a chore for me to even just to get up. Listen to me. Come to the waters. Come to the waters of expectation. And when you come to those waters, you come out expecting good things. It's not just another season where we get into the water and we go, well, here we are. It's a season of expectation that you're getting ready because in Judaism and even Messianic Judaism, we're following into the, this, the month of Elul. Elul is the month of saying, I am my beloved's and he's mine. That's a good place to be. 
When, can I say this to you as believers? When you come into that place to say he's mine and I'm his, that's home. That's paradise. That's back. There's nothing hindering you. There's nothing pushing you away. You say, he's mine. I'm his. I'm home. You all with me on that? Come to the waters of expectation and hope. Kaba, tikva, that place of hope. Anybody else? Yes. Well, I'm just going to follow up on what you said, and I'm thinking, how do I say this? But I thought of the young lady who came to you for an anointing, and she was healed, expecting it. And we have a couple of weeks to reflect on our own hearts and that we should come expecting him to work in our life yes. and expecting that he's going to touch us in a real way. I mean, and that that's what I originally raised my hand about was expectation. And I, the fact I really that appreciate you. That. I appreciate you sharing that because when you came here today, congregation, whether you're a visitor or whether you're here home, when you came, did you come expecting or did you just get up to say, this is what we do? I hope that you come through the doors expecting good things. One, one year, Roger will remind me of this every time because he laughs. I asked the congregation, I said, how many of you came in with a heart of rejoicing? Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And everybody just kind of looked around. I said, okay, guys. I said, here's what we're going to do. Everybody go outside. I want everybody to go outside, and I want you to come through the doors rejoicing with an expectation. You know what? The entire congregation went back out, and they came into the doors like this. Young people, old people, the kids are going, what's going on, mom? You know, but everybody's coming in like this because we come in with a spirit of expectation that Adonai is going to do something. See, if you, if you come into this life and it's boring, honey, you're in the wrong place. Life with Messiah should not be boring. When that young lady came up suffering two years from a neurological disease where she had pain all throughout her body, she came up expecting. She didn't come up to say, well, Rabbi, I'm here. I'm just hoping something happened. She came up expecting her healing. And guess what? She got it. When was the last time? Go ahead. Praise Yeshua. She, she shared on Tuesday that she went to see the doctor. And the doctor said, well, maybe it's this. Maybe, you know. We saw another guy get healed like that. They call it spontaneous remission. No explanation. Spontaneous remission. And they tried to tell her that, well, you know, maybe this or that. And she looked at him in all the boldness of, how old are you, honey, 17, 18? 18. She looked at him with all the boldness of chutzpah of an 18-year-old. And she said, no, God healed me. So when was the last time you had expectation in your heart for something good? The world, Fox News, and all that stuff. That drags us down to where we lose our expectation. Michael, would you please come? <laughs> we, we are coming into a place of expectation for good things. Adonai is good, and his mercy endures forever. And the world and your job and sometimes your family or your friends and people are going to drag you down, but we are coming into a good place of expectation. I want your expectation levels to be up. I want them to be off the charts. Because it's, it's good. I got a couple in the back. They're getting married in October. Amen. Praise Messiah. Listen, can I share this with you? They're getting married, and he's not sitting there going, oh, my gosh, I got to do this, I got to do that. She's not sitting there going, oh, man, I got to have to do this for him now, and my life's going to change, and this and that. You know what? I guarantee you that they are expecting good things from their relationship to come. Right, guys? See, they nodded yes. So how is it that they can expect good things out of their marriage, but we lose that expectation and hope when we're following Messiah? He's our heavenly bridegroom. There's going to be a marriage supper of the lamb and the bride. How many want to be a part of that? Well, when you come to the rivers of living water this year, come with a, an expectation in your heart of good things because we serve a good God. And though the world is going to hell in a handbasket, we're called to be a light to the world. And actually, we're called to see who will come with us into this thing. You know? How many want people to come with you into this thing, right? Would you stand with me? Did you get anything out of it today, guys? <laughs> Hallelujah. Just, just if you would, lift your hands. Father, I'm asking you this morning. Ben, would you bring that mic back? I'm asking you, Father, for a spirit of expectation upon your people. That some of us, Father, have been through 
been a hard season for some. But Abba, you have good things that are coming. And so I'm asking you, Father, to release a spirit of expectation of good, of good, a spirit of expectation of good in Yeshua's name that'll drive out any other voice, that'll take away any other spirit, and that we'll stand and we'll give you the glory and the honor and the praise. Father, my prayer is that when we go into those mikvah waters, that you'll do something awesome to us and through us, that we'll be vessels fit for the king. Father, forgive us for holding any kind of an attitude that's not of you. Father, I think we're all guilty of that at some point. Wash us clean. Thank you for the blood of Messiah, salvation in him. But we take that step of faith knowing you are our hope in Yeshua's name. You are our hope. Before we do anything else, I want you just to lay hands on the person beside you. Pray, us, pray hope for them. Would you do that? Don't leave without praying for somebody hope. Lay hands on somebody. Just hope. Pray hope. Take a moment to pray hope in the name of Yeshua. Thank you for hope. Father, spirit of hope in Messiah's name. Spirit of hope in Yeshua's name. ask you to make a confession of faith with me. Let's say this together before we leave. I'll say the blessing over you. Let's say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, I trust in your Son, Yeshua, Messiah, the living hope of Israel, living waters. I'm not going to have a spirit of discouragement, but I walk in your spirit. I'm encouraged today. In Yeshua's name, thank you for good things that are coming. For greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. In Yeshua's name, all his people said amen. Come on, give Yeshua a hand clap. Would you do that? It's a blessing. over you. There is, um, just real quick, there is a class afterward. Take about a 10 minute break. If you need prayer, we're going to encourage you to come up. Uh, some folks have said they want to become members of the congregation. They're interested in, and really want to go a little deeper in what we believe. Statement of faith, if that's you taking the next step, then uh, meet me back in the, uh, the Torah room in about 10 minutes. So um, we'll have a, a class there today, just a short class. And um, Hope you can come and hope you can make it. Are y'all blessed today? Encouraged today? Praise Messiah. Give me that reverb and bring it up. Isai Adonai Anavilecha Vesecha Shalom Now may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift his face and may he shine upon you and give you his shalom through the Prince of Peace, Yeshua the Messiah. He is our hope in Yeshua's mighty name. And all his people said, Amen.